Yeah, they will say, I don't know the standard, and now some people may be cheating, or why would they even do this? This isn't even a test of fitness. Yeah. Or This is stupid. Ooh, this that's is a good one. This yeah. isn't even a test of fitness. Right. Yeah. Why and are you bothering with that right now? Why aren't there any heavy barbells? Uh, or why are there only heavy barbells? Like any style will be, someone will complain about it just based on their own strengths and weaknesses. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You How do you know if you're right or wrong? There, there's a, at no point two days before competition should you train so much where you're getting sore going into the competition. Or at least in my opinion, I think yeah. that's a really bad way to peak for a competition. Yeah. All right, fellas, we're, uh, what, a week away from... Oh, uh, uh, yep. I don't know what's happening. I don't have headphones. Oh, you can't hear it? Claps. Yeah, claps. Oh, the first ooh, one thank was you, like, thank the, you. Yeah, I was trying to give you a nice welcome. How many intro. days as of this recording till quarterfinals start? Seven days. Seven as days. of this recording? Yeah. No, no. not the recording. When, yeah, the, when yeah. this comes out, seven oh, okay. days. okay. Well, that's... Well, come on, answer the question. <laughs> oh, well, I don't even know what to... Whatever, it's, whatever. It uh, doesn't matter. Yeah, two By weeks, the time you hear days. this, yeah. <laughs> there'll be seven days of quarterfinals. Boys, what is the mood out there with all your athletes heading into this quarterfinals weekend? Anxious. Oh, my God. Yeah. It is anxious. Anxiety city, I feel like, but I think actually it's normal. Totally. I, every single year that I've done this in, in the, it's probably true even outside of the unknown and unknowable context, but the more unknowns there are and the more that unknown period comes, I feel like anticipation goes up. People stop sleeping as well. People start getting tweaky. They start even having, at the high level. Oh my God. Totally. I think more at the high level. Yeah. People think of, or I don't know maybe if, if people think this, but I've heard that People anticipate or look at high level athletes and think they're not experiencing the same things as people that are in like that, you know, whatever, 75th percentile. They're like, oh, they train all the time. They don't really experience this fear or pain or angst. Yeah, yeah. But I think it's actually worse because you're at that level, you're dedicating your whole life to this thing. So that or pressure at least it potentially yeah. could be worse. Yeah, it yeah, could dif be. different yeah. kinds yeah. of well, I mean, they yeah. care and then they have higher expectations, yeah. which I think More play, play a role. Yeah. You know, Tiger Woods always used to say he's like, you should be nervous. That He's means you care. He's behind you right there. He's he not is, even yeah. looking at us Boom. this week. Turn him. Hey, fix him. Jeez, Tig. Yeah. All right, yeah. there we go. Eye contact, baby. <laughs> That's probably the first time it. the audience noticed he was even yeah. there. Yeah. You got a nickname for him? You call him Tig. Tig, little yeah. tag. I do think that that's cool though. That's a good way to like kind of reframe your mind of like it's okay to be anxious or nervous because that means you care. And then it's just like you got to channel that energy into actually like executing well as opposed to getting you off of your game. Yeah, Ar arousal and anxiety is necessary for high level performance. Now there's a balance because you can get over aroused or over anxious, and then you have these like adrenaline type feels where you like can't feel your oh, hands. I've had that before, and it's yeah, awful. It's very uncomfortable. You've had that for CrossFit. Not for CrossFit, but for other things right. like <laughs> like golf. <laughs> so so lame. So sad. That's uh, true. Oh man. Yeah. And just in that split two seconds, I was like, "Where's he going with uh, this?" Yeah, I thought so too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay, okay. okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. But well, you you could also be like under, or you know, you go in too calm to something that you need like tension and anxiety. You can almost underperform. So accepting and embracing when that like heart rate escalation or your thoughts start to get doubtful, you have to almost get into a state if you want to be an athlete and really in any realm, you have to just get okay with understanding that that's normal. And the more you train and the more you practice, it doesn't necessarily go away. You just get better at performing yeah. in spite of that feeling. Exposure. Being very, yeah. yeah, yeah. I feel like, like what else feeling. is going on out there? I think I've over the years now, I've seen that as we get closer to competition, there's this phenomenon of people being more in tune with their bodies and any aches and tweaks that are coming up. Y'all seeing that right now? Yeah. Well, I have seen it. I've seen a couple of people with it. Also, the from a physiological perspective, if you start hyperventilating more, which is pretty much most of CrossFit, and if you start getting anxious, pain receptivity actually changes. So I think it's a it's a phenomenon psychologically that people become more in tune because they know they're going to need their bodies, but it's also something that is, is pretty normal. That, well, that would be during a workout, but what is it about? No, no, like, it, overall. Oh, okay. I yeah. mean, like if you're doing more it, inflammation, it, yeah, 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 just in general, it, it rampens your nervous system up and then you become hyper receptive to yeah. pain and tweaks, even if there's no injury present. There's yeah. a lot of people that have gotten images and MRIs and they're like, oh, there's nothing wrong here. But they're like, well, I'm experiencing pain. A lot of that is actually just driven by kind of what you're doing. And not to mention people are probably training a little bit more or yeah. a little bit more intensely. So then you are going to have some aches and pains or tweaks, whatever. N niggles, as the people yeah. say over in <laughs> Europe. Yeah. What else uh, around this time are people feeling? Uh, I think there's a lot of rumors that go out at this time. So there's a lot of like, oh, what's the workouts going to be? Or I heard this. Pe these people say this. Is this true? Does that bug the crap out of you when you hear athletes being predictor guy? Uh, 
Be honest. <laughs> Y'all just look at each other as if you want to say something, but you're not going to yeah. say it on the podcast. I mean, yeah. I get it, right? Especially with our sport. We've talked about this for years. It is the unknown and unknowable. So people are always trying to find the answer. And each year they keep changing it, right? Like this year they just sent out something that, hey, everything can be done in the class setting. Well, what does that mean? Does that mean there's going to be no GHDs, no rope climbs, no um, maybe uh, handstand walks or shuttles because that takes up too much space. And so then people want to predict. And so do we as coaches. Like yeah. we're always trying to hedge our bets by making sure that we're programming the right things yeah i don't get mad when people predict because in some ways we are trying to predict how yeah. to set people up for success i do get frustrated when people get maybe too caught up in their own predictions that where they're like oh i need to be doing more of this this is going to come yeah. out and i'm like trust me i've, I've been down this road for many years i've i've oh. been so certain that something is going to come out and then like I think it was 2018 regionals. They just literally took the barbell out of the whole region. And I was like, wow, I totally unprepared people for this because I thought that I knew what was going to come out. So I have always just now kind of tried to, all right, let's take a step, step back and just say, we're going to get all the fitness qualities better with like 80% of the time. And then 20% of it is like, Hey, we're making predictions based on what we think and what they've said, but let's not get too bought into it because we could be wrong. And yeah. sometimes they purposefully zag when they're supposed to zig because it's part of the like allure yeah. of the sport. Well, you just lit up another one though. There's people who right there towards the, you know, in the final days are like, Oh, I needed to spend more time doing this and start panicking about what they may or may not have done or start thinking that they needed more work when really they're fine or. Well, that's the yeah. dangerous game because then people overtrain like a couple days left before the competition. And then all of a sudden you talk about the injuries that you were just mentioning. Does that really happen a lot? Oh, for sure. Overtrain before I, people will look back and say, I only did 20 muscle ups over the last week and I need to do another 40 or 50, but it's like two what days before competition. To? You How do you know if you're right or wrong? There, there's a, at no point two days before competition should you train so much where you're getting sore going into the competition. Or at least in my opinion, I think yeah. that's a really bad way to peak for a competition. Yeah. So with a week left, what should be what should people be thinking right now? Yeah, I think the biggest thing is that we need to understand that most things are going to be out of your control. So only control the things that you can control, which is going to be making sure that you're peaking correctly, which we just talked about. And if you're in one of our programs, that's what they're doing, right? Like the next week is going to be pulling back a little bit, really refining all the skills, your movement patterns, and making sure that you go into the competition feeling 100%. And then making sure that you're executing well on game day, which is obviously having good warmups, good cool downs, making sure you're recovering between workouts and having a good strategy plan when you're in the workout. Yeah, I mean, it. it Chris is this the boring stuff is going to come out because we repeat it all the time but it at this point you've done all your training year you've gotten your strength levels as high as you can get them you've gotten your conditioning as high as you can get it you've done skill work of all the things that could potentially come out in a week you don't really make a lot of progress on anything specifically you need training time to get that up but what you can do is get your mindset ready for what you're supposed to be doing in a week and you allow your body to get less fatigued so you can go in some people will need a little bit more breathing in that time some people would need a little bit less some people lift a little bit heavier in their taper those things are kind of individualized but generally speaking drop your training volume and then do the mental things that are necessary start to visualize your setups for where you're going to be doing your workouts start to set process oriented goals hold on let's break that down visualize yeah, yeah. what are we doing well, it, it's harder in this sport to visualize than maybe other sports where you know your arena and your race or what you're doing. It, but it's pretty much proven that if you spend proven? time, yeah, pr yeah, proven with vowels, it's almost proven with vowels, <laughs> with vowels. That, <laughs> that if yeah. you, if that many high performers like Michael Jordan and Tiger Woods spend a ton of time going inward and visualizing their shots, visualizing the feel. So in the CrossFit realm, if you know quarterfinals is in a week, we're not going to have floor plans ahead of time. We're not going to know exactly what we're doing, but you are going to know where you're doing it. So you can start to visualize, okay, I'm going to get up in the morning. This is what I'm going to do. This is what I'm going to have packed. This is what I'm going to have prepared. Oh, non-workout stuff. Yeah. All like, the other crap that you know, driving to the gym. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Little things that you can do that now, get you set up. My initial thought into is that it. seems excessive. Tell me why it's not. Well, it, excessive relative it might be excessive relative to somebody who's recreational right if you're just doing quarterfinals you want to have a good time you might not want to spend an extra hour of your day kind of visualizing journaling doing those little things unless you want to try to figure out how to get to your potential as a human and where you are you just said unless you're recreational do you think a lot of people get up to this point and then trick themselves right here at the end right at the finish line oh i'm recreational now 
because now it seems like there's pressure. I don't want to. I don't, don't want to have to prove to myself that I can put all my heart into something. So now I'm just going to say I'm taking it and doing it for fun. There are some people that do that, but I think the opposite side of the coin is what usually happens. And in particular, you talked about the excessive thing, right? People will think, oh, I don't want to do all that because that is excessive. But then they're the same ones that will repeat the workout three times oh. because they're not happy with their score. Yeah. Or they're the Chris's who like they have done CrossFit no and for no of the year. And then yeah. it's like, oh, the open's coming. So now I'm going to do six Metcons in preparation for it. So they do this drastic jump because now they start taking it seriously as opposed to... You did a good job for well, only doing six Metcons. I wouldn't say that Metcons. I was taking it seriously. I, I just knew I didn't want to get completely like <laughs> kicked in the face. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I don't... The weird thing about this sport is I feel like no matter how good you are, you get kicked in the face. 100%. Like you can't just go in and be like, oh man, that was just smooth beautiful execution yeah. with no pain it's like whether you're good or bad it's gonna hurt well, the fitter you get the faster <laughs> yeah. you go All the right, more yeah. pain but okay so excessive visualizing these things that yeah, aren't I, the workout i mean i don't think that it's excessive i think that visualization mental control mental focus emotional regulation those skills are, are valuable for life and in, in any realm in professional setting in uncomfortable conversations so if you're participating in something as a recreational sport I would say doing those things is probably more important than the like super hard stuff is just yeah. paying attention to your goal setting, how you're going to control yourself, how you're going to behave. If something goes wrong, how you're going to deal with it. And those are things that you can quote unquote control because they're your attitude. They're your focus. They're how you're going to show up to the situation. And the more of those things you take out of your like out of your decision making needs, I, like I think that. the less stressed you are well, as a human. It's like you've practiced it once in your head so that when it happens, you're not reactionary. You're just, you're just doing what before. you practice. Yeah, yeah, I like that. Yeah. Especially with my little pea brain. I, you know, <laughs> talking about how you're going to drive and how you're going to eat on the day of competition, I, I think for my pea brain, that would be great. Yeah. The Chandler Smith just posted a thing on his story. And every Sunday, he does all of his food prep. And then he also lays out all of his outfits for the whole week, all of his training outfits and everything. And, it, he said in there, it's one less thing that I have to think about going into the training week. And a lot of times people that are like not taking things as seriously will look at things like that and be like, oh my God, that's overkill. Why would you do something like that? Like, it doesn't matter. Just wake up and pick out an outfit on the spot. But those little things, those little behavioral traits can lower your stress levels, lower your anxiety. Let's say it adds, it takes away five or 10 minutes of things on five different things throughout the day, you saved an hour of your day by just planning ahead and thinking ahead. So if you're going into a high pressure situation or you're going to travel and go and do something, generally speaking, those are great times to spend some time processing emotionally the other things that are going to help you succeed in those yeah. periods of time. Yeah. And then the same thing's true if we take a step forward a week from now, the workouts come out, you want to visualize those workouts because now you actually have it. It goes back to that. You talked about Michael Jordan visualizing his shot. Now you can visualize your workout by sitting down and then maybe you just come through, go, go through the process of, okay, I can do handstand pushups really fast, but these double unders are going to be really challenging. How do I want to pace the workout? And then you just keep revisualizing that in your head until you come up with a pacing plan that's going to work for you as an athlete. Have you guys ever seen cool runnings? No. What? I saw it yeah. as a kid and couldn't tell you crap about it. Oh my God. You've never seen Cool uh, no, Runnings? No. That's, John Candy, that's right? it. I'm done. This <laughs> podcast is over. Cool Runnings is a story about the, the Jamaican dogs. bobsled, the bobsled. Team. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like the, it was a bunch of sprinters. I don't know how much was dramatized in the movie, but basically a bunch of Jamaican sprinters, they get into the qualifying race. Two of the guys ended up tripping each other and not qualifying for the Olympics and sprinting. And they put this together- this is based on a real story? Yeah, it's based on it a real a Jamaican bobsled team. Oh. Yeah, I'm sure they like changed the. I'm sure it's <laughs> the not whole exactly story is wrong. <laughs> yeah, yeah. If somebody fact check me in the comments. But <laughs> I, I hope to hell <laughs> this is just a good comedy. Uh, yeah, I mean, at the end like of the movie, they have like you... pictures of the real team and like, oh, okay. uh, yes, yeah, so I'm pretty sure it's okay. a, like a Hollywood dramatization of it. Anyway, the reason I was bringing that up is that there's a, a scene in the movie where they have the whole bobsled track and they're sitting in like a. Uh, a bathtub together in their outfits and they're going through every turn and they're leaning at the same time or in formula one, they know they're going to race tracks and they get on simulators. It's like every single sport in the world goes through this pre visualization process or basketball coaches will put people on the free throw line and they'll be like, all right, you know, there's 
two seconds on the clock. You got to make this. And they're trying to create these scenarios. Yeah. I've that seen people here like just set up it. empty barbells and empty stations, but they'll just walk and they'll practice their transitions that way. Yeah. And they'll, you know, pretend like there was weight on the bar and wait, you know, whatever, but it, they'll yeah. walk through it. It used to be one of my favorite rituals when we would go to an away game in college, I would go out to the field and we just had like our normal walk through and I would kind of walk through the plays that I knew we'd have in our script by myself. Like maybe the te- the rest of the team just kind of hanging out and I would think about, okay, we're going to start in the left hash here and I'm going to go block this guy. But like close my eyes and kind of walk through it and feel the grass. I go barefoot. Like it just, that kind of thing would set the tone for the competition that was coming the next day. Yeah. You played football barefoot? Well, <laughs> when I walked yeah, through. Yeah, in I the did. walkthroughs. Yeah. Oh. Not in the, t- <laughs> the feeling of the turf or the yeah. grass is nice when you're just like, I mean, it's the day before, right? Okay, you're not but that had running. nothing to do with your practice. <laughs> it's like ground, it's grounding yourself to what's going to happen yeah, the next no, day. No, they weren't barefoot. Well, I was going to say, this dude's crazy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so I forgot where we were. I just wanted, we were talking to, about I wanted to just bring up things cool you can control. Yeah. What else, Brandon, falls into that category? Uh, well, I think the next step is planning out your recovery once you have those workouts. So this is going to happen, and we talked about it already, right? Like the person that says, I'm just doing this for fun, they'll still probably retest a couple of these workouts, especially now we'll get maybe four or five workouts, we yeah. assume, right? Over a five-day period. That means there's going to be more time to retest. So the reason I say that is, let's say you do a workout Wednesday night. It doesn't go well. Now you want to redo it on Thursday, but you have another workout you need to do. You're going to do a little bit more intensity. There may be more volume than you're used to. So having a really good warm-up and a really good cool-down so that you're recovering between those sessions and you can bring your best effort to each one is going to matter more than a normal training session. So coming up with that game plan as soon as those workouts are released is really important. Yeah, I think there is like there might be a level of athlete that kind of just looks at it, shows up, and does the workout, sure. doesn't really think too much about it. But I think for most people – you're going to get a series of workouts and have these couple of days and going through some sort of planning exercise in your head to make sure you have little things like gummy bears, protein powders, all, all of the pro, um, peanut butter, like all of the easy things that you could potentially need to eat. So that way you have some sort of bag to make sure that in the actual days of the workouts, you have your food and nutrition taken care of knowing what day are you doing what workout in what order, right? Like we, we see As the, of work- the filming today. Do we know anything about how the setup's going to play out? So we don't know if they're going to announce yeah. them all on the first day and then you have five days to do it. We don't know. Yeah, anything. I, from what I've heard and the barbell spin thing that was kind of more focused on team quarterfinals is going to be Wednesday to Monday. There's a time checkpoint in the middle on Saturday And there's going to be four workouts with potentially more scores. So what I'm guessing is two workouts in that first period of days, two workouts in that second period of days. But I don't know if that was just team quarterfinals. And then also they said the four floor plans are coming out with the workouts on Wednesday. So that was a little bit different than previously, which means that on Wednesday, there's going to be a big like brain dump of information. You got to go through, read all the workouts, read all the standards, know what the format is, and then start to plan out. Well, what's your order? If there's a a one rep max in one of the workouts, for example, and you're an athlete that's weaker, you might want to do that one first because you want to make sure that you're most fresh. And if you're somebody that's a more engine dominant athlete that knows that they're going to crush the one rep max, maybe you don't do that one first because you want to be as fresh as possible to go into the, here's what I assume will happen. I think a lot of people will end up waiting to see what other athletes do, the order that they pick and they'll just defer their decision-making to them. Like, Oh, well, Ricky did it like this, so I'll just do how Ricky did because Ricky knows his stuff. Is that a dangerous way to think about these types of It could be, especially if you are someone that's like overly strong or overly weak. The best way to do this, I think, is just have a really reliable coach. And we'll do that. Like for all of our online athletes. Easy for you to say. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, but it it, it really does help because then you can have all those scenarios. So like the way that we've done it in the past is we send out this strategy and pacing guide. And in that guide, we say for those athletes that maybe are super weak and or like the ninja, they'll do this order. For those athletes that are very strong, they need to make sure that they do it in this order. And then there's options for every level of athlete. You might want to change our guide's uh, language. Calling these fools super weak. (laughs) (laughs) You got to rub it in like that. Why can't they just be weak? Yeah. yeah, they're super weak. Oh, Extremely. Super weak. Yeah. Super weak is actually above weak. Oh. It's actually better than weak. Yeah, oh, you didn't know oh, that. Actually, super actually. weak is closer to oh, strong. Yeah. Nice. You didn't know exactly. that. Exactly. Yeah. What is like weakest of weak? <laughs> That's probably me. Yeah. <laughs> Just yeah, yeah, a picture yeah, of my yeah, face yeah. down there. Yeah. No, definitely not. Um, what were you saying? I lost my train of thought. But we were just talking about the ordering. So oh, having yeah. someone that can guide you in that process, it's it's really easy as an athlete to just get excited about one workout and feel like you need to do that first. But if it has 
200 chest bars in it and then you're yeah. sore for everything else, it's probably a bad idea. Generally speaking, back to your question, mimicking high level athletes is never a good idea because high level athletes are and well, in some areas it, it's okay, but modeling exactly what you do after somebody that is a world-class performer is not always good, especially for a recreational person, because they're just built different. They're training eight hours a day. They have way more experience. They're way more intuitive about their skill sets because they've done so much practice of it. They probably have more help setting it. Like exactly. all of our people are going to have you guys doing yeah. so much crap for them and they just walk in and do the workout. Whereas yeah. if you're... At your own gym, you got to set all this crap up. and yeah. yeah, so I would say it's probably not a great idea to just say like, oh, this person's doing it and they're the best or they're close to the best, so I'm going to do what they do because I, I can't do better than that. You might have to be thinking differently. Like if there's a workout that has 150 GHD sit-ups in it and you're not somebody that does a lot of GHDs every single week, like maybe they come up and you do, you scale it and you do half the volume or you, you know, only do those once a month. If you did that workout and you expect that you're going to repeat it and do it again, you might not have the resilience to do it. So you might have to plan, okay, well, I got to move this workout here because it's going to make me really sore and I'm not going to be able to recover. The highest level athletes in this sport, they don't really think like that. You may have just touched on it, but when people are the, – the people who maybe don't know how to order things because they don't have a coach and they've never really done that, is there a mistake that, that people uh, will walk into more often than not when they are ordering these things? What's something that you can give the people at home – uh, to no, not I, I think I think the big one is just doing the one that they enjoy the most first, which typically means they're better at it, which means they'll probably go faster, which means they'll get more sore. I know that was like the step, you know, four step process, but that that's the problem that I've seen in the past. It's just like they get really excited. Well, so do that or don't do that? No, don't do that. I'm don't saying do the one you like the most. T typically, typically, that's the problem for someone that just got doesn't it. know how to order it. Got they it, jump it. right in, they do a workout, they go really hard, they get really sore. And See, my brain would say, well, wouldn't I want me to be the freshest to do the one I'm going to crush the most? So here's the thing. If you're someone that's going to qualify for semifinals, you do need to think that way in that you have to have really good scores for all of them. And if you have but one for everybody else run, who's not those 40. But, but for, most, yeah, <laughs> yeah, for, for yeah. most people, it's going to matter more about optimizing all four scores or all five scores. So you need to think about it that way. It could also be minimizing in this workout format, it could be minimizing your weakest score yep, could exactly be the right. most important thing for you because you on a leaderboard with, I don't know how many thousands of people, but let's say 50,000 people are on the leaderboard. If you have a workout that you're like, all right, well, if I'm, you know, if I do okay on this one or not okay on this one, it's a change in a couple hundred places. If it's a one rep max and you're like in the, in that realm where 10 pounds could be a hundred something places, then it might be most important for them to strategize on that specific workout because right. that could be the biggest one that kills their score in a leaderboard. So it is, I don't think there's general rules that you could apply to everyone in every situation, but I think it's about thinking critically and kind of controlling the controllables is seeing the workouts and saying, okay, based on these workouts and my skill sets and maybe the information that you would get from coaches, especially I think the people that are following us that are part of our actual programs or one-on-one -on -one coaching, they already have this stuff taken care of by their coach. But for the people that aren't, you basically have to sit down and do some critical thinking like, okay, I'm really good at these movements. So this might be a good one for me. This one is good, but I'm not really sure pacing wise, like, can I do this unbroken or not? This one is going to be really important for me to execute and hit my number and really kind of go through and walk through each workout and try to come up with strengths, weaknesses, general game plan. Do you think it's a repeatable workout? Like the deadlift, let's use the two workouts from the open. Workout one was pretty fast and nasty, very low skill. And workout two had double unders and a lot of transitions and rowing. I had a lot of people that repeated, well, not me personally, but saw a lot of people. Workout one was not a, a workout that a lot of people repeated and did better in. It was just very high power. You had to be very good at the pain tolerance side of it. And the back fatigue from for most people of hinging with one side at full speed that many times they couldn't recover quick enough to do better on it but you almost see yeah 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 he's another he's somebody that tried to repeat it didn't get better but the double under one 
I saw a ton of people that were like, oh, I just missed a bunch of double unders. So I repeated it and got another yeah. 25, or changed their reps. pacing plan because it was 20 minutes. Exactly. Yeah. So you got to look at workouts and be like, all right, this is a repeatable one or this is not a repeatable one and really kind of come up. And that's different for every athlete. Like Travis could do 200 wall balls on Monday and then do it again on Tuesday. I could do 200 wall balls on Monday and, <laughs> and then, then three Tuesdays from now. <laughs> yeah. And in eight weeks, I'm, I can do five wall balls. So you got to know your athletic profile, your recovery profile, and you got to do some, you got to do some critical thinking. Like you can't expect a podcast like this or a coach to give you all of the answers, but hopefully we can kind of give you some guidance to say, Hey, here's what we've seen in the past from people doing these types of workouts and how you can navigate it. Yeah. The, the last one that I always think about, and we see it every single year, and I've been guilty of this, right, is controlling your attitude. <laughs> Workouts will come out, and it's going to happen this year, especially with probably the change in quarterfinal style of programming, where you're not going to like a workout. Or maybe you love all of them, and you're in a better mood, but don't let the workout selection dictate your attitude toward performance. Yes. You know um, what I fucking love is when you're <laughs> around the person who doesn't give a shit about any of that, and they're just, oh, they're just so playing nice. the game. It like you, it's they, refreshing, they have an aura right? around them, and you're just like, yes, I'll do whatever you say. <laughs> yeah. Take me on your journey. Yeah. So yeah, don't be that guy. Yeah, it's gonna be easy to get sucked into your point, especially with any me. You know, we might put out something negative. Everybody else in the space might because there might actually be negative shit to talk about. However, if you're playing the game, you just gotta play. Yeah, no, I I I've definitely been guilty of this, and I've maybe made some criticisms public in the past that maybe I wouldn't now. But I think for high level performance and for athletes and uh, as an organization, we're going to try not to do any of that stuff in less, maybe retroactively, like, all right, now the competition right. is over and we want to go in and do some criticisms or what could have been done better. And we want to have a discussion about it. But in the moment, I think maintaining a positive mental attitude or a focused mental attitude of neutrality and not letting, oh, this is a good workout because I'm good at it. Or this is a bad workout because it's bad at it. Or last year there were V-ups and people were like, what the hell? Why did these come up? This standard sucked. And yeah. and the reality is your feelings don't matter on a leaderboard, they, but they will matter to your performance. And if you go in with a negative attitude and your brain is thinking about all that negative stuff, I've seen that be like a negative thought loop that self-sabotages totally. performance. I've seen a middleman version of this whole thing too, which is they hear this, what we just said, and then they know it. So then they go into the weekend and, and so now they're like, I'm not going to be negative. I'm not going to be negative. And they kind of then just, they still get all the negative shit out, but like in a way that's like, I'm trying not to be negative. <laughs> <laughs> they, dis they disguise the negative. Everything's caveated. <laughs> yeah. it, it, have you seen that where it's like this weird spin? It's like, you're acting like you're positive, but you just said all the negative shit. A lot of it is still, way. it's like deep rooted inside. Maybe you never express it, but even if you're going through that in your own brain, I think what you're doing is you're focusing on the things that you can't control. Like the, the, all of the things you don't like about it, instead of focusing on the things that you can do well in the workout. And so it's, you are sabotaging yourself, even if you're trying to be positive. And it is way. such a bummer when yeah. you've put in so many years, months, weeks of this crap. And then now you're just going to, oh, this sucks. Yeah. But, but Max, to your point, do it after. Like yeah. I, I am totally fine with that. And we do it every year. We, we sit down as coaches and say, okay, how do they program? What did we like? What did we not like? Maybe we can give, inform them on some things that they missed in testing, whatever, not that they asked for it, but yeah. still those are things that are important and that's okay. But during the competition, you're taking yourself away from focusing on the ways you can optimize your performance when you're stressing about the things you can't control. Yeah. I mean, I am... This kind of ties back to what we were speaking about before with visualization and mental control. And I have had to put just in my personal life and it started as an athlete, but then it translated into my coaching business ownership, and then also just personal life satisfaction. I have had a lot of negativity in my past, negative self-talk, beating myself up, participating in sports like this one where I didn't agree with a lot of the ways things were doing or that people weren't being honest about certain things. And that negativity, it chews you up internally. Like you think of it like, oh, I have this way of venting or I'm going to put it out there and it's going to make a change. But the reality is it doesn't do shit. Like it only does something negative to you inside. And I've had to work on coping strategies and it's not like you can just say, I'm going to be positive, And then all of a sudden you're going to be positive. It takes a lot of work to control your headspace. So if things do come out, there are tools you can use. Like sit down, journal, get all your negative feelings out. And for each one of the negative feelings, like, oh, I hate this workout. And you could write it out honestly, but then go in and reframe it in a way that's like, okay, 
I hate that they put V-ups into this workout. Then the next thing that you write underneath it could be, but I love this sport. I love participating in it. Part of it is unknown and unknowable. So I'm going to try to meet the standard and not be upset about this. And you can start to unwind your negative self-talk and refocus yourself into a more neutral headspace. And there are active tools you can use from like sports psychology to do this. But as a general rule of thumb, I would say that if you get stuck in a negative headspace, you are going to perform worse and you're not going to like what you're doing. So it should be one of your biggest priorities and part of visualization, journaling, meditation, breathing can help you in that process to make sure that you crush it on game day and also enjoy your experience. Yeah. I mean, go ahead. Right now we've been talking about negative things. What are some of the pitfalls that you see people stumble into? Like the things that they choose to be negative about? What are the one, the common ones during quarterfinal weekend or an open or something like that? I have the workouts. Yeah. Work, right? It's just workout style, the movement selection. Like what I mean, are the, people, some of the exact things you might hear? The, the one, the V-ups is a good example. And I understand the criticism that it was really a hard standard. Some people were touching their shins. Some people were touching their toes. You're like, what, how am I supposed to do this? The legs the, yeah, so you'll the legs hear people be like, I don't understand the standard. Right, what are they right. saying? Yeah. They'll it's say, negative. I don't know the standard. And now I, some people may be cheating or why would they even do this? This isn't even a test of fitness yeah. or this is stupid. Ooh, this that's is a good one. This yeah. isn't even a test of fitness. Right. Yeah. Why and are you bothering with that right now? Yeah. yeah. Uh, why aren't there any heavy barbells? Uh, or why are there only heavy barbells? Like any, any style will be, someone will complain about it just based on their own strengths and weaknesses. <laughs> yeah. I think that is it is people let their, the emotions of, because if somebody gets a weird, unique thing that comes out, but they're really good at it, they're going to hear them bitching at yeah, all. Yeah, yeah. they're going to yeah. be like, oh, I, I like that they oh, do Nordic sing. Oh, Nordic Curls are in? Yeah, exactly. If somebody gets that, if they get the luck of the draw, generally you're not going to see any complaining on that right. side. So it's generally, you see something come out, a weakness got exposed, or something novel came out that really challenges you. Like some people couldn't cross their arms over in front of them when the cross unders came out. Those are usually the things that cause the most negativity. And what I've learned over time in the sport is you just, you have to become more neutral about it because we're not going to get control. It's like the Josh Bridges thing that I brought up on one of our things. Like it's their sandbox and they're going to decide <laughs> yeah. the rules of their sandbox. So if we go in and play, you're just going to have to expect that somebody's going to throw sand in your eyes yep. at some There's point. There's a bully like, in yeah, the sandbox. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we had one of the masters at that. Now he probably wasn't perfect, but Noah, he, oh. I mean, he's a perfect example of yeah, for sure. That. Yeah. You mean in terms of maintaining a yeah, positive yes, mental just, attitude? Yeah. yeah, for sure. I think he rubbed off on me a little bit in that oh, way. He or for maybe sure rubbed off on me. Yeah, or maybe he just challenged me to be like, Man, this dude is so happy about I everything. I think about that sometimes. Yeah. I think about me and you, who we would be if Noah wasn't here. Uh, both of us specifically. Yeah. Because yeah. yeah. <laughs> me and you tend towards like yeah. negativity. <laughs> yeah. and, I'm, and I know I can speak for myself that I think he rubbed off and if you just said it yeah and i think about that sometimes like what who the, who the fuck would we be if that dude yeah didn't he's and he's more resilient physically i think partially because he's of so it. positive yeah, yeah like you you know i get my back hurts <laughs> and i'm like all right i gotta go hibernate for four weeks <laughs> so to get over my, yeah, I'm, like, I'm crying <laughs> in my bed because my back hurts <laughs> whereas he will frame them differently and frame it as a recovery process and be like, Oh, I get more rest time. And not necessarily that he's happy about bad outcomes, but yeah. he's just positive when things don't go well. He's it is a lot of people make the assumption when we talk about Noah, that it just comes natural to him. It doesn't. If yeah. you've been around him, it's he's choosing to yeah. make that, that choice, which is way different than just being like, Oh, he's just happy. Yeah. yeah. And it's come through practice. We talk yeah, about yeah. that, like exposure in, in training, you need exposure with your attitude as yeah. well. Like you just need to keep yeah. overcoming it journal, like Max said, and then you'll get better and better at reframing those things. One thing I will say, and I, there are a lot of people in CrossFit that I think have excelled at the highest, highest level that do maintain a negative focus. Cause I do know that like for wrestling and combat situations, being very hateful and aggressive and uh, like uh, just mean can actually help you perform. Hold on. We might be blurring lines here though, because it's in that same mindset though, are they like getting nitpicky about all the little rules and, is that what you're talking uh, about? No, I yeah. don't think so. They, I do just, they see a, it's uh, more, a, an opponent come up and they're like, ah, this opponent? It's more, like, the, yeah. You're talking about proving someone wrong in the sport. Yeah, right? I'm Travis just talking, is like, talking I want to prove everyone yeah, wrong. I'm An talking angry about attitude. negative motivation. Yeah. Yeah. But one thing that I have noticed about that is that it burns people out and a lot of people don't like what they're doing. So yeah. I'm not sure even if you do have that internal like, oh, I could bring more out of myself if I 
tap into that negative aggression, it might actually stop you from enjoying the sport and doing it long term. Yeah. So I think it's still it's something a, it's to work on. It's a hell of a fuel. Yeah. It's just, it's going to sure. ruin your car. Yeah. yeah. It's a hate. But it's going to yeah. work really good. Yeah. Yeah. Until it ruins your car. Yeah. There's a quote list saying like anger is like the acid inside that burns you more than the person. Fucking get it out there. Yeah. yeah. I, mean, I wish I could have had the exact quote. That was good. Yeah. That's really good. Yeah. That was shitty. Burn that quote. Oh, what else? You guys? I, I, I mean, my thing would be like an encouragement, right? Have fun. It, and I get it's so hard. Yeah. We've been talking about attitude, but like just, we all yeah. have trained so hard. We're doing the sport that we love. And even if the workouts aren't great, like enjoy the process, test your fitness, and then you can come back to the drawing board afterward. Yeah. I mean, it's hard to have fun in a sport that you push yourself in like this. It's, it's hard to have fun in, in competitive sports in general. Cause there's, there's winners and losers, right? It's not a creative thing where you can just do it. And there's not a, like a very specific delineated outcome. Yeah. But I do think that, there needs to be more of, especially at the recreational level of this sport, celebrating that you are, if you're doing the quarterfinals, you're not the top 25 percentile. You're like the top 0.00001 percentile of human beings in terms of <sighs> physical capacity, about expression. That. It is pretty For cool. For real. Like if you did the quarterfinals with like, if you went into the airport. Go to the airport. And the airport. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I win. Yeah. 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 For real though. Yeah. But you would be. It's rough out there. Yes. Yeah, so people get upset that they're comparing to these other 0.01 percentile humans and doing worse than them, but really try to reframe and celebrate yourself, get the most out of yourself, set process goals, try to like set, find your limits and find these other things that potentially could help drive you that are irrespective of the leaderboard. Yeah. Like you're still doing the sport and you still need to focus on the leaderboard if you're doing the sport. But I would encourage, like Brandon said, have fun, have a process, and really take time to realize that all of this is temporary, most likely. There's not going to be many people that are participating in CrossFit at a competitive level for 10, 15, 20 years. So if you are in it, you enjoy and relish the opportunity to push and suffer and be in a community of people that is like really hard charging and doing really hard things in, in the name of personal development. And I think we mentioned this on our last episode on how to pre prepare for quarterfinals, but for the person who knows, I'm, I'm probably not going to make it to semifinals. It's all, but it's a lot obvious. Of yeah, <laughs> what a lot. is the thing you hope, what would you sell me on really put my heart and soul into this weekend, this mm. week? Well, I think the big one is again, you've trained for this. So give it your best effort, right? Don't leave anything out there. And then the other thing, people do off-season competitions quite a bit now, and they're, they're becoming more and more prevalent. And so use this as practice for that. So it could be fuel in both ways. Yeah. I think of it as learning, learning about yourself in the sport, but I don't know. Yeah, maybe I'm getting... Set you up for next year better because yeah. you learned X, Y, or Z. Yeah. But I also, maybe this is more philosophical and I'm getting older, but I think of sport and all of the things that I've learned in sport as being really life lessons for how you deal with things, how you deal with pain, adversity, setback. So if you can use it as an opportunity to learn about yourself, how do you deal with anxiety? How do you, you never know somebody right now that's participating recreationally in a sport might give birth to the next Michael Jordan or the next top level person in a realm and having these skills of knowing how to deal with adversity, setbacks, pain, performance, they can be helpful in people's professional life, parental life. So I would say try to focus on how is this making you a better human being outside of the athlete side of yourself. And if you do that, you can always find wins. Like you can always find something at the end of a weekend, even if everything went bad. Even a little thing of like everything went bad and I stayed in it and I did it and I finished and I'm proud of myself for doing that. You can find a way to context that there's something very valuable in stepping out of your comfort zone in a situation like this. And I'd encourage people that are recreational like that to frame that as part of your process is, is what do you want to learn about yourself or what do you want to say about yourself when the weekend is over that's irrespective of the leaderboard because those are things you can kind of control a lot easier you can't control if bosman and castor came out with workouts that are just all of your weaknesses even if you execute well you're probably going to get smashed on the leaderboard but if you go in there saying hey i want to learn about how I can perform and where my limits are, even if weak workouts come out for you, you can excel in them relative to yourself and come out feeling good about yourself. Yeah.
I like all that. that being said, y'all down to do an episode completely shitting on the quarterfinals next week, yeah. <laughs> right? So Monday of the when the workouts are closed, I'm going to turn on my shit talking hat and I'm going to go what after cross. What if we're like, holy crap, they nailed it? I'd be the first yeah. time. <laughs> wow. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. You had that great I know, speech. I, know. I just said negativity. <laughs> Don't be negative. It just seemed like a perfect oh, comedic timing. Oh, yeah, for what real. else we got in the pipeline? Anything? I think that's, that's it. That's it. You'll yeah. have to just stay tuned. Good luck at quarterfinals. Have fun. Crush it. And be positive. Yeah.